wildfires are burning. The third anti cross takes power. Unstable and the fire spreading. And it's just heard in the last hour. But a further 5,000 people are set to be evacuated. But even when you're told there is no hope, somehow you still manage to find it. Hey, welcome to Mission Hill. So good to have you with us today, whether you're joining us in person, one of our campuses, or from somewhere in the world online. By, by the way, if you're joining us online, make sure you drop in the chat. Uh, where you're coming from. Our hosts love to see that, and we're, we love that we can join together through technology uh, really all over the world. But however you're coming together today, we're, we're just really glad you're with us. We're starting a new series. I'm kind of excited about it. I know a lot of people are excited about it. I've, I've heard a lot about it. I've heard people say, hey, we, we've never done anything like this. Not true. We actually have. We, people just forget. But, but I am excited we're going to be doing this. We're starting a new series today called um, The End of the World as We Know It, A Message of Hope which I know sounds strange because that's not what you usually think of when you think about the end of the world stuff, right? It kind of reminds me, there, were, there was a song a few years ago, this little bit of an age check for our congregation. There's a song, and some of you already know where I'm going, right? A few years ago, there, were, there was a song by R.E.M., remember the band R.E.M.? And they had a song called The End of the World as We Know It. How many of you remember that song? Yeah, let, let's, let's, there's a line in the song. I want to sing it together, okay? Can we do that? Okay? Not exactly a worship song, but I think it's worth singing. I'll, I'll set you up, and then we're all going to sing it together. It's, it's a weird line, right? So, so that towards the end of the chorus, it goes, It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's awesome. What's weird about that line is that, you know, fine, when you think about the end of the world, fine, right? When you think about, you know, end times and, and uh, you know, Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation, fine is not the main feeling, right? Fine is not the main thing we feel. I, I think we feel fear. I remember growing up, fine is not what I felt when we talked about that. I remember growing up in church and hearing messages about the book of Revelation or Sunday school lessons, you know, and we'd talk about things like the rapture. And by the way, if you're kind of new to church, we'll talk about this a little bit next week, but rapture is one of those things that happens around the time of Jesus. But apparently there's a moment where like, all the Christians kind of like disappear for a while. And, uh, and I remember hearing that lesson and then I was at the grocery store with my mom and we were in an aisle and she said, hey, would you go over to the next aisle and get something? I was like eight or nine. And then she's like, get that and then come back. And so I went and I got it and I came back and she was gone. And I was like, I missed it. I missed it. She's, 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 she's raptured and not me. And, and it was panic, right? It was panic. And so a lot of you, if you grew up in church or you had any kind of exposure to the, some of this end time stuff, that's probably your main feeling. It's not fine. It's what? It's, it's fear, right? But, but over the years, the more I've taught on the book of Revelation, the more I've studied the book of Revelation, the more I've kind of figured out that the reason that what we feel is fear instead of fine is because we got a faulty focus. We're focused on the wrong things. We're, we're focused on what we might have to go through, not on what we're going to get to. And that's really key. When we focus on what we have to go through instead of what we're going to get to, it kind of generates emotions and feelings that God honestly never intended it to do. And, and the reality is there's a lot of things that we have to go through that we don't like in order to get something we do, right? If you've ever dated, you know the reality. Sometimes you got to go through some goobers to find some gold, right? It's just, it's just true. Right? Sometimes you got to go through a, a couple of jobs where you're like, man, I really don't like this to get to a job that's really fulfilling and it gives you a sense of significance and meaning, right? Sometimes you just got to go through some things to get to something that's really good. But if we focus on the stuff we got to go through, we're, we're going to have problems and we might get stuck. I, I remember a couple of years ago, I, um, I started getting a, kind of a little bit of a toothache. And at first it was just when I ate cold things, but I was like, well, I can probably, you know, stand to cut down on the ice cream a little bit, so it's fine. And, and then, then it got to the point where it, it kind of hurt even when I drunk like, you know, sort of semi-cold drinks, and, but I was like, well, I heard that drinking cold things is not good for your digestion, so that's okay. And then it, then it kind of started hurting even when I had hot things, but I was like, well, I've got two sides of my mouth, right? I can just chew on the other side of my mouth. But then it got to the point where it was just kind of hurting all the time, so I, I went to the, the dentist and... Uh, and, and he kind of, he took an x-ray and he's like, yeah, you, you've got a little hairline fracture in one of your molars and some bacteria's gotten in. And I can actually see you got a significant infection down there. Why did you wait so long to come here? And I was like, because I'm a man. I don't, I don't, I don't know what, what your point is. He's like, well, as a man, you're going to have to man up and you're going to have to get a root canal. So he set it up for the next day and I went home and I'm going to be honest, I was just, I was in a bad mood, right? I was in a bad mood. And finally, Coletta calls me and she's like, what, what's wrong? And I was like, well, I've got a root canal tomorrow. She's like, yeah. I was like, well, you know what they're going to do, right? They're, they're going to stick needles in my gums. 
And I know that the point of that is to make them numb, but it's not numb when they stick them in and it hurts and they do it like 30 times. It's really painful. And then I'm kind of numbed up, but then they're going to drill through my tooth and that's not fun, right? Like I may not feel it, but I can feel them banging around in there. And it always feels like they're not drilling. They're, they're using a jackhammer. Like, what are you guys doing in there? That, so that's uncomfortable. And then, then there's, there's going to be blood and then, you know, it's going to, it's going to, the Novocaine stuff's going to wear off and then it's just going to hurt after that. And she's like, and you know, then what's going to happen? And I was like, what, what's going to happen next? She's like, and then you're going to be able to eat cold things again. And then it's going to stop hurting. And I was like, God, you need to make my wife more sympathetic. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what she's, she's good in so many ways, but here she just, I don't know. You just need to move Jesus and her spirit or something. But, but she was right. She was right. I was focusing on what I had to go through, not what I was going to get to. And if you focus on what you got to go through instead of what you're going to get to, sometimes you can get stuck and sometimes you can kind of start to feel that there's something, something going on that's not worth going through. And I think that can happen with the book of Revelation. So what I want to do in this series over the next few weeks is I, I, want, to, I want to reframe the book of Revelation. I want to reframe all of the end time stuff we find in the Bible in the way that I believe God intends us to have it framed, the way that I believe God intends us to look at it. And I'm going to start today, but I want to give you three truths about the book of Revelation that you might not know. If you want to follow along, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 1, Revelation 1.1. It's pretty easy to find if you've got a physical Bible. Go to the last book, flip back, and you find the beginning of that one, okay? Super easy. By the way, Three truths that you might not know, that, that's true whether or not you love the book of Revelation or not. Some, some people love the book of Revelation. Some people have books in their, their houses and they get charts and diagrams about all the different stuff. And maybe that's you. Maybe you love that stuff. I'm, I'm going to give you three things today that you might have missed about the book of Revelation. I missed them for years. But, but also, you, you may be one of those people that doesn't like the book of Revelation. You actually kind of avoid the book of Revelation because you've seen the people with the charts and the diagrams. And you can't make heads or tails of it. And you're like, I'm just going to stay as far away from that thing as possible, right? I'm going to tell you three things about the book of Revelation you might not know today that will change the way you think about it. Here's how the book of Revelation begins. The revelation from Jesus Christ, who, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. First thing I want you to notice is I want you to notice how much of an emphasis there is here on Jesus he kind of goes out of his way to make sure you understand we're talking about Jesus. Jesus is the main thing we're talking about here, right? He says, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And in the original Greek that this was written in, that of Jesus Christ can also be translated about Jesus Christ. Everything here in these opening words are about Jesus. And what's really interesting is that if you flip to the very last words of the book, really literally the last words of the Bible, we see the same emphasis. Last words of the Bible, last words of the book of Revelation. He, and that's Jesus, who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. And John, who's writing, says, amen, that means truly. Come, Lord Jesus. He's like, bring it on. And by, by the way, listen to me, church. If, if you don't read the book of Revelation and get to the end and go, come Lord Jesus, if that's not your reaction at the end of the book of Revelation, you're reading it wrong. You're reading it wrong. After everything that John's seen, he's, he's not afraid. He's not worried. He's not nervous. He hears everything and he, and, and he hears Jesus, I'm coming soon. He's like, yeah, Lord, bring it on. Come on. If that's not your response, then you're reading the book wrong. This is the grace of of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. It's Jesus. The book of Revelation begins with a very strong emphasis on Jesus. This is kind of the first words. It's setting the table for the whole book, and it's about Jesus. And then it ends, and as we saw it a couple weeks ago, last words are in first importance. We saved the best for last. The last words of the book, the last words of the whole Bible are about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Now, yeah, there's some other characters in the book of Revelation. There's some other minor characters. They're, they're, yeah, there's, there's a beast, and there's, a, there's four horsemen, and two witnesses, and seven angels, and a dragon, and all that. Yeah, there's some other characters, but you need to understand they're minor characters. Okay, they're bit players. The problem is that we often give the bit players top billing. We make them what it's all about. And when we do that, we miss the point. 
It, it kind of reminds me, December 17th, 1903, something amazing happened. Does anybody know? December 17th, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright made the first successful heavier-than-air flight. They got their plane to fly. Now, it only lasted 12 seconds. But a lot of times, big world-changing things happen with very small beginnings, right? Kind of like a baby born in a manger. 12 seconds, but they knew everything just changed. And so they immediately, they finished it, and they went to the telegraph office, and they telegraphed their sister, Katrina, and they told her everything that happened. She was so excited, she ran down to the newspaper office in their town, and she said, hey, they just did it. 12 seconds, it's flu, it's, it's possible, and everything's going to change. And, and then she said, and by the way, they're going to come home for Christmas, and so if you want to do a personal interview with them, they're going to be here. So the next day, she got the paper, and she's like, well, there's nothing on the front page. That surprised her. Nothing on the second, third, fourth, fifth. It wasn't until they got to the sixth page, she finally saw the story that she was looking for. But here was the headline of the story. You ready? Wright Brothers Home for Christmas. <laughs> like, you, you missed the point. You focused on the wrong thing, and that meant that you, you missed the point. The, the reality is that the, the book of Revelation is all about Jesus. And if you focus on something besides Jesus, you're going to miss the point. And by the way, it's not just the book of Revelation, it's true of all end times prophecy. All end times prophecy in the Bible is ultimately all about Jesus. I don't know if you know this, but that's true even of the very first end times prophecy in the Bible. Do you know where you go for the first prediction of the end of the world as we know it? The book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. The moment Adam and Eve sinned, the moment Adam and Eve listened to Satan and rebelled against God, God started telling them, here's what the consequences are going to be. And he told Satan what the consequences were going to be. And this is what he said to Satan. He said, and I will put enmity. I'll make enemies between you and the woman. And between your offspring, and I think he's probably talking about the other spirits, the other angels that fell with him, and, and hers, her offspring. And he will crush your head. And that's interesting because he, he shifts to the singular at this point. He's not talking about all of the, the descendants of Eve. He's talking about one descendant, one ultimate descendant, some, one ultimate person who came from Eve. He said, he will crush your head, Satan, and you will strike his heel. Yeah, you're, you're going you're gonna to take a shot at him. You're going you're gonna to hit his heel, but he's going to strike your head. And you know who he's talking about, right? He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. The, the very first end times prophecy is about Jesus, and it's true of all of them, so listen to me. All end times prophecy in the Bible is ultimately about Jesus. All end times prophecy. Book of Revelation, book of Daniel, Jesus preaching on it. You find it in Isaiah, you find it in Jeremiah. It's, it's all over the Bible, but it's all ultimately about Jesus. And, and if we miss that, you're going to miss the point. And, and you're going to feel some things that, that God never intended you to feel. Here's why it's so important that Jesus be our focus. This is what Jesus said. He says, the thief, and he's talking about Satan. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's all he's got to offer. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Hear those words, church? It says, the thief can only destroy life, but I came to bring it. And not just to bring any kind of life. I came to bring life that's to the full. I came to bring life as, as honestly, you can't even imagine it. I came to bring life as God intended it, as God meant it. And we can't even imagine how good that's going to be. Because the problem is we live in a world that's so broken that even in, in our wildest imaginations as we, as we dream how good could life be, it's nowhere close to what it's actually going to be. That's why one of the realities that we're going to see throughout this series is that the end of the world as we know it is a message of hope because the end of the world as we know it is actually the beginning of the world as God meant it. And it's so good that we don't even have the imaginations to understand it. But Jesus said, that's what I came to bring. And that's why our focus needs to be on him. Here's truth number one about the book of Revelation that you might not know. I encourage you to write this down. The book of Revelation is all about Jesus, the life bringer. The book of Revelation is all about Jesus, the life bringer. And that's where our focus has to be. If that's not our focus, we're going to miss the point, and we're going to end up in a place that God never intended us to be. And by the way, that's not just our focus when we're reading the book of Revelation or when we're reading end times prophecy. That, that's honestly, it's our focus just as we're doing life. The, the Bible says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. 
It's not just as you read the book of Revelation. It's not just as you read end times prophecy in the Bible. It's as you do life. Your eyes have to be on Jesus. Your focus has to be on Jesus. Because here's the deal. And some of you, I know, some of you are here, you're listening to this message just because you need to hear this word from God. Our feet follow our focus. You hear me, church? Our feet follow our focus. We inevitably move towards whatever it is that we're focused on. It's inevitable. And we we forget that. And and we think, well, no, I can can still be faithful to my wife, but but I can focus on on that girl at the gym, or I can focus on those girls on the screen. It's not going to keep me from being faithful, but our feet always follow our focus. We go, no, I, I can follow Jesus and I can, I can focus on my bank account. I can follow Jesus and I can focus on, you know, my career to the exclusion of everything else. But we can't because our feet follow our focus. If our focus isn't on Jesus, we're going to end up in a place that right now we can't imagine ourselves ever getting to, but we're going to get there and we're going to, how did I get here? Our focus. So I want you to wrestle with a question this week. And the question is just this. What are you focused on and where is it leading you? What are you focused on and where is it leading you? Because I know that some of you are focused on something other than Jesus. And it's leading you to someplace other than the life that he designed for you. What are you focused on? In fact, you know what? Would you just pray with me right now? I want to pray over you. God, we want to invite you right now to just move among us. Move in each one of us. Show us where our focus is on something other than Jesus. And maybe by your grace, even give us a glimpse of where it's leading us that we don't want to be. And maybe give us a glimpse of where it could lead us if our focus is on the one who deserves it, on Jesus. Reveal those things to us right now, Lord, and give us the courage to get our eyes off of those things and onto Jesus. Amen. You should wrestle with that question. Let God work in your heart this week. It's so important that our focus be on the right thing because our feet follow our focus. And whatever you're focused on, that's going to determine where you end up. It's going to determine what you get, what you get out of life, whether or not you experience the life that God always intended for you or not. Certainly, as we read the book of Revelation, our focus needs to be on Jesus. It's, it's all about Jesus. And if it's not Jesus we're focused on, a couple of things are going to happen that God never intended. Listen, here's what happens. See, when we focus on the not Jesus stuff in the book of Revelation, when we focus on the not Jesus stuff in the book of Revelation, end times prophecy, here's what happens. Two things. Number one, we feel fear and we get weird. Okay? Can we just be honest with each other? You focus on the not Jesus stuff in the book of Revelation, you're going to start to feel fear and you're going to get weird. Okay? It happens. You, we're going to get weird. We're going we're to start building bunkers. We're going to start watching preppers and taking notes, right? We're going to learn how to churn our own butter. We're going to dress our kids in denim jumpsuits. We're going we're to become homeschoolers, right? Now, now, listen, I know I just offended some people. You can't get offended at me because we homeschooled our kids, okay? So we, we, we're fine with homeschooling. Homeschooling is totally fine. It can be a really great option. Okay, we loved it. We homeschooled our kids all the way up to high school. It was awesome. Nothing wrong with homeschooling. But here's what I figured out when I was homeschooling. In every group of homeschooling families, there's at least one family that's just weird. <laughs> and, and if you're going, well, we homeschool, and I know a bunch of homeschools, and none of them are weird, it's you. <laughs> you're the weird one. Like I, was, I, was, I used to be part of a ministry that sort of explored intersections of faith and culture so we could equip people to speak the truth into those. And we, were, we had an event coming up, and so we were at a homeschool convention. We had a booth, right? And at one point, I looked up, and there were four young men in front of me, and they, like, they, they kind of went from like 18 to 8, but there were four of them. They were like you know, perfect heights. They were arranged, and they were all wearing the same outfit. It was a tweed suit with a little bow tie. They all had blonde hair slicked back in the exact same hairstyle. It was weird. It was like Stepford children, right? And, and I looked up, and, and, and they're like, and what are you all about? And I was like, you're creeping me out, man. <laughs> I, and I said, well, we, we help people explore intersections of faith and culture. And they go, oh, so you're preparing people for the apocalypse. No, no, no. The, we, things are going on in culture where there's a good opportunity to speak the gospel. Ah, so you're preparing people for the rise of the beast. No, 
no, you're really creeping me out. And, and, and eventually they walked off and they all walked off kind of this very, like, it was, it was just weird, right? And, and I, um, I immediately, there were some other people coming, so I didn't have a lot of time, but I grabbed my phone. It was, a, it was one of the first versions of iPhone where they had autocorrect. And I, and I typed to my lead pastor of my church, I said, homeschoolers can be weird. And I didn't really look at it. I just sent it off because I had to have some other conversations. And afterwards, I, I looked at it, and, and I kid you not, for a while, Siri would autocorrect homeschoolers to home hookers. Totally true. So I texted my lead pastor, home hookers are weird. And he wrote back and he's like, how do you know that? I was like, I don't even know how to begin fixing this situation. Okay. But this is what can happen. Okay. And and I've seen it happen. You've probably seen it happen. We focus on the not Jesus stuff. we, We feel fear and we get weird. Now listen to me. The book of Revelation is not meant to make you feel fear. It wasn't written to make you feel fear. It was written to make you feel something but it's not fear. Look at Revelation 1-3 with me. Blessed. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. I don't know know about you, but I, I think most people don't think about the end times prophecy in the book of Revelation and think, boy, I'm blessed by reading that. But it's actually worse than that. I don't know if you know this, but the Greek word translated as blessed there is also the word for happy in Greek. It's, it's, it's the word for happy and full of hope. So, so try it that way. Happy and full of hope is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And happy and full of hope are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. When you think about the words of Revelation and the prophecies about the end of the world as we know it, do you find yourself feeling happy and full of hope? And if the answer is no, you're reading it wrong. Your focus is on the wrong things. See, when we focus on the not Jesus stuff, we feel fear, we get weird. But what about when we focus on Jesus? When we focus on Jesus, we feel hope and we get busy. We feel hope, and we get busy. Instead of building bunkers, we build lighthouses. We start getting busy sharing with other people the hope that we have in Jesus. We share with other people what we're getting to, what's coming and what can be ours if we'll just keep our eyes on Jesus. When we focus on the Jesus stuff, we feel hope, and we, we get busy. What so many people fail to understand about the book of Revelation, what I, what I missed for years, is that the book of Revelation is a love letter. Do you know that? It's a love letter. It's, it's a letter of encouragement from your father. It's basically God saying to you, I know things are hard, but hold on because there's hope. That's truth number two. I want you to write this down. Truth number two about the book of Revelation you might not know. book of Revelation is your Father in heaven saying to you, I know things are hard, but hold on because there is hope. And we need hope because things are hard, right? I don't need to convince anybody that times are hard. I mean, over the last couple of years, I mean, what have we seen? We had a global pandemic. We had racial injustice and, and, and civil unrest. We had political division and violence that came out of that. You know, we had COVID-19. People, people wrote me. They said, hey, is COVID-19 described in the Bible? Is this the beginning of the end? We, we had the controversy over the vaccine, and people wrote me. They said, hey, is, is, is the, the vaccine, is that the mark of the beast? We asked those questions because we looked at what's going on around us. We said, this is hard. Things are difficult. We've got economic recessions. Russia invades Ukraine, and people wrote, and they said, hey, is that, is, is, that, is that Russia rising from the sea? Is that Russia rising? Is that the beast? Is Putin the Antichrist? We ask these questions because things are hard, and we're just talking the global stuff, right? What about your own life? My guess is, for, for many of you, the last few years have been hard. Maybe, maybe your marriage feels like it's falling apart. 
Maybe your relationship with your kids or your parents just feels like it's turned toxic. Maybe you're sick. Maybe somebody you care deeply about is sick. Maybe they've died and you're struggling through the grief of it. Maybe you're, you're stuck in a job that feels like it's sucking the soul out of you, but, but better options just don't seem to be opening up and you're, and you're stuck. Maybe you're consumed with anxiety or depression. Things are hard. And that's why God wrote the book of Revelation. That's why all the end times prophecy is there. All of it is God saying to you, it's your Father saying to you, I know things are hard, but hold on because there is hope. It's not always going to be like this. And what's coming is so much better than what you're going through that you can't even imagine it, so just hold on. The book of Revelation is all good news. And I know that's not the way we think about it. But in, when it's properly understood, the book of Revelation is all good news. There's really only, <laughs> there's only one piece of bad news in the whole book of Revelation. And people are like, ah, it's the, it's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's the bad news. It's not. Well, then it must be the, you know, the great tribulation that's coming. We'll talk about that more next week. But that's not the bad news. Well, it must be the rise of the Antichrist. That's the bad news, right? No, it's not the bad news. Here's the only piece of bad news that you're going to find in the book of Revelation. Only bad news in Revelation is that there is only hope for those who are willing to let Jesus sit on the throne. The book of Revelation is a book of hope, but it's only available to those who are willing to let Jesus sit on the throne of their lives. Revelation 1.4. John, who is the one that was given this vision and encouraged to write it down. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you. Don't miss that. As he starts off the end time stuff that seems to generate so much fear and concern, he says, grace and Grace is the goodness of God. It's the undeserved goodness of God. The goodness of God upon you. And what does he say? Peace. It's not a book that was meant to scare anybody. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne. And if you have the ability, I want to encourage you to underline or highlight or circle that word throne. It's a really important word in the book of Revelation. I missed this for years but here's the interesting thing. The word throne plays a prominent part in almost every chapter of the book of Revelation. You find it in the first chapter, you find it in the last chapter, in almost every chapter. I think there's only two chapters where the word throne doesn't show up. Throne is over and over and over again in the book of Revelation. Why is that? Because at its heart, and this is truth number three today, at its heart, Revelation is an invitation it's an invitation to let Jesus take the throne of your life. Because if he's on the throne, there is hope. But if he's not on the throne, there's no hope. Revelation is an invitation to let Jesus take the throne of your life. A little farther down, Revelation 1.17, John sees Jesus. He sees Jesus in a new way. John was one of the followers of Jesus, so he'd been with Jesus throughout his ministry. He saw the death of Jesus. He saw the resurrection of Jesus. He saw Jesus leave earth. But now he sees Jesus kind of as he really is with all of the veil pulled aside and all of the, uh, the glory revealed. And this is how he responds. This is 117. He says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He fell at his feet. Because that's what you do when you see somebody who belongs on a throne. You fall at their feet. In the ancient world, when you see somebody coming towards you, the first thing you do, you do is you, you go, hey, you know, where are you in the social structure? Where are you compared to me? And when you saw somebody that you know belongs on a throne, you didn't kiss them on the face. You didn't shake their hand. You didn't even kiss their feet. You bowed down where you were. You fell down where you were, and you literally you blew kisses. It's interesting. The Greek word is proskuneo. Pros means towards and kineo is to kiss. And so when you realize you're in the presence of someone who belongs on a throne, you would fall down and you would blow kisses towards them. And it's interesting, that word, pros kineo, that's the New Testament word for worship. To worship is to bow down and blow kisses. It's to fall down because it's a recognition, you belong on the throne and I don't. John sees Jesus and he realizes that's the one who belongs on the throne of my life. And so he falls down. 
And then the one who belonged on the throne placed his right hand on me. It's the hand of favor. And he said, do not be afraid. I don't know if you know this, but there are 365 times in the Bible that the command, do not be afraid, or some version of it shows up. There's one for every day of the year. And here at the beginning of Revelation that so many people find so scary, the one who belongs on the throne reaches down to the one who knows who belongs on the throne, and he says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Death is not a worry for you because I've got the keys. For you, there is no fear. For you, there is hope. Because you know who belongs on the throne. So here's my question today. Who's on your throne? Who's on your throne? Because the book of Revelation is an invitation to put Jesus on the throne of your life. And if he's there, you have hope. If you don't, there's no hope. And some of you are here today, and you've never put Jesus on the throne of your life. You know, it goes all the way back to Genesis. Adam and Eve were created and God was on the throne of their lives. God was calling the shots. And they understood that he's good and and what he tells us to do is for our good. But then Satan came along and he called that into question and and he got them to look at God and go, hey, we appreciate life and everything and that's that's great, but I think we're going to take it from here. If you would just step off the throne, we're going to have a seat. We're going to decide for ourselves. We're going to call the shots. That's what happened. They, they put Jesus off the throne and they sat down with themselves. And How's that working out for us? You look at the world around us and you go, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is what God meant when he looked at everything he made and said, it's good? No. It's not working out. Some of you are here today and you've never put Jesus back on his throne. Maybe... Maybe it's because you've never been to church and you've never really thought about this. And it's awesome that you're here today and that God's working in your life and you're hearing this truth. Or or maybe, honestly, there's some people, they've never put Jesus on the throne, but they kind of thought they did because they go to church. They're in church all the time. That's putting Jesus on the throne, right? And and my response to always is that, as always, and you've heard me say it, I go to Chipotle a lot. It doesn't make me a burrito. (laughs) But some people have put religion on the throne thinking that's the same thing as Jesus, and it's not. So maybe you're here today and you're realizing right now as as God is speaking to you that you've never put Jesus on his throne in your life. Today's the day. I'll give you a chance to do that in just a second. But but I also know that there's a lot of people here today that, yeah, they've put Jesus on his throne. They came to that moment where they went, Jesus, it's not working out so good. (laughs) Me being on the throne, money being on the throne, sex being on the the throne, drugs, alcohol being on the throne, my career being on the throne, my possessions. Well, you, you, you realize that, right? And so you said, Jesus, have a seat. And our sins were washed away and we were adopted in the family of God and that was fantastic. But then what what often happens is that we end up kind of asking Jesus to scoot over, right? Now, we would never say, hey, would you get off the throne? We'd never say that. Well, it's your throne. But, but, you know, it'd be kind of nice if my career could get a little bit of space. If you could just uh, scoot over a little bit, right? I'm just going to put, you know, career there. You know, I mean, just, yeah, it's your throne, Jesus. You're the only one who belongs there. But if you could just just scoot over a little bit because I really, you know, I'd like money. If money could get a little bit of space, that'd be great or it's that relationship, or it's whatever it is, right? We, we just ask Jesus to scoot over, and, and then before we know it, Jesus has stepped off the throne, and something else has taken the center seat. Chances are you're here today, and as I'm saying this, the Spirit in you is moving, and you're realizing, huh, that's exactly what I'm doing. Who's on your throne? If you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, but in this moment you're realizing he's not, he's not in the center seat where he belongs. 
that I've allowed something else to take his place. Would you do something really courageous right now? If you're realizing that's happening, would you just slip your hand up? You see those hands. I, I, I love you. I love that courage. Let's pray over this together. God, thank you for my friends. Thank you for this word. Thank you for the reality that as long as Jesus is on the throne, there is hope. But Lord, I, I see places in my life where it's happening and a number of people have indicated that they see places in their life where it's happening. And so Lord, we come to you and we, we admit it. We've given something else your seat. And we're sorry. We're grateful that we have forgiveness. You love us so much, you died to pay the price of every wrong thing we've done and the price of every wrong thing we've put on the throne, and so we have it, and we're grateful for it. We confess it, we accept your forgiveness. And then we ask for strength through your Holy Spirit to, to put that thing in its place. Maybe it's not a bad thing, but it does not belong on the throne. That's your seat. So give us the strength to do that. And Lord, as you take your seat where you and you alone belong, would you fill us with hope and peace? As we continue in an attitude of prayer with every eye closed and every head bowed, wherever you are, I want to speak to those of you that have never put Jesus on the throne. It's not a question of moving that one thing that you allowed to take his place off. It's, it's, it's a radical kind of overhaul of the way you've been doing life because you realize, I, I never let God be on the throne. I never let Jesus be on the throne. But maybe today you're, you're looking back at your life and you're looking around at what's going on and you're realizing, yeah, that's not working out. There's still hope. There's still forgiveness. There is still joy. There's still peace that can be yours. But it's only when Jesus is on his throne and so it's, it's time to put him there. I think today is the day for you. And you just need two things to... To make that happen, you, you need some truth and you need some trust. Here's the truth you need. God loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his own son, Jesus, to die on the cross, to pay the price for every wrong you've ever done, for every sin you've ever committed, for everything that separates you from God. Jesus died to pay it off. Three days later, he rose from the dead. It, it's truth. It's a historical fact. But you also need some trust. You need to look at Jesus and say, I think it's time for you to take your seat. I think I'm going to follow you from here on out. And if you're ready to do that, here's how you do it. You're just going to have a conversation with God right now, wherever you are, just have this conversation with God. Say something like this. Say, God, I've sinned. I'm sorry. I've sat on your throne. I've put other things on your throne. That's not working out so good. I see that now. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. I, I believe you rose from the dead and I'm ready to put my trust in you. Jesus, take your seat on the throne of my life. I'm going to follow you from here on out. Amen. We've had several people make that decision for the first time this week, and can we just celebrate that? Can we celebrate God moving in the lives of all of us who realize who belongs on that throne? Hey, hey listen, if you made that decision for the first time this weekend, man, we, we want to know about it. We want to celebrate it with you couple things you can do to let us know. I want you to let us know, and you can do it a couple ways. If you're watching online, you can click the button real near me. If you're on one of our campuses, you could stop by the Welcome Center to tell them, I said yes to Jesus. They've got some free gifts and resources to give you. But everybody that made that decision, here's what I'd love for you to do. Text the word Jesus to 80875. If you said yes to following Jesus today, just text the word Jesus to 80875. Let us know you made the decision again. All that's going to happen is we're going to send you some free resources to be in experiencing the hope that is ours when the only one who belongs on the throne is on the throne.